One summer, a settlement arrived from Bergen, a city in the south of Norway, to Tromsø, a city in the north, also known as the capital of the Arctic. I gave myself a month to ride the two and a half thousand kilometers between these two cities, camping along the way, in the wild as much as possible. After heading in the wrong direction for several days to hike to Trolltunga, taking another detour to ride Atlantic Ocean Road, then cycling the 600 kilometer coastal highway to Lofoten, I finally made it to the island of Andoya. I had learned about Andoya from a Norwegian couple who described it as a paradise, with Caribbean-like waters lap and white sand beaches. When I arrived, however, I was greeted by a howling headwind and an icy rain. For the most part, I kept my head down as I pushed forward, but when I did look up, I saw a brown and weather-beaten landscape where hardy shrubs and small trees clung to the wet ground lest they be sucked by the tempest into the sky. When this world had siphoned most of my energy, I scoured it for places to sleep, but I had read that Andoya was known for a certain type of land, and it was clear that it was all around me. Og, endless stretches of flat ground, all of it thoroughly saturated with water. Og is to the camper as the ocean is to the dehydrated. Having made it to a campsite, I awoke the next morning to the sound of gentle waves and the sunlight warming my tent. Now nearing the end of my trip, and with several days into my flight home, I asked the receptionist at the campsite what there was to do nearby, and she recommended a short hike to a local beach. So, after a quick ride up the coast, I left my bike at the trailhead and set off to explore on foot. Sheep grazed on luscious green hills that were woven into a coastline of crystal blue inlets and coves. After weeks of cloud and rain, or feeling like I might never make it to the north of Norway, it was a relief to take a slow and winding walk beneath the sun. While I had retreated from the elements into my mind the previous day, the sun now had me looking out in wonder at this curious corner of Norway. After outrunning a posse of flies that chased me from the trailhead along the road, I arrived in the village of Bleak, where one of the longest white sand beaches in the country is flanked by swaying green grasses and glistening blue waters. Having taken a ferry from the northern tip of Andoya, the next morning I found myself beside a fjord on the island of Senja. I loved Senja as soon as I saw it. I hadn't thought it possible that anywhere could feel more remote than some of the places I had seen in Norway, but Senja did. On average, Norway is home to just 17 people per square kilometre, but on Senja, there are only five. Outside the distant archipelago of Svalbard, Senja is, at 1,500 square kilometers, the second largest island in Norway, with a population of less than 8,000. Arriving was like that moment you notice the fridge stop humming. Oh, you think, this is silence. As the sun warmed my tent the next morning, I looked at a map and realised it was only another hundred kilometres to Trunza. This made me happy. It meant I would no longer have to ride past the point of enjoying it. If I saw something of interest, I could stop and look. I could even go to see Segla, a mountain someone had described to me as an alien fortress. It was best seen from Mount Heston, which was only a few hours away, overlooking the village of Fjordgard. 
to the lapping of the sparkling fjord and the chirping of small birds, I struck my tent, then set off along the coast, instinctively urging myself onwards until it occurred to me that there was no need. In fact, I should make more of an effort to pause and to soak in the landscapes. At one viewpoint, I admired a headland that resembled a serrated knife and passed the time reading on a sunlit rock beside the sea. When a band of flies discovered my location, I continued. The coast of a deep blue fjord, watched over by spiralling white birds, led to the Mount Heston trailhead. I put my valuables, a carton of orange juice and some nuts into a backpack, left everything else by a shelter at the trailhead, locked my bike to a post, then began up the trail. I've just started on the trail to Heston Mountain. Uh, it's about 3.30. I saw a sort of older guy at the bottom of the trail who had just come down and he said it took him about an hour each way. Uh, there's only a few other people on the trail, so uh, hopefully it's not going to be too crowded up there and I'll be able to get some nice views of the neighbouring mountain Segla. The path ended at a narrow rock-covered ridge about 400 metres above the fjord and 150 metres beneath the summit of Mount Heston. At first, the incline was forgiving and I was able to skip onwards over the rocks but the mountain became steeper and steeper in parts almost vertical and I had to use my hands to pull myself up. An hour after starting the hike, a small sign came into sight at the end of a long path. It marked the top of the mountain. The challenging route to the summit meant many made do with the view from the ridge, and so when a small group left, I had the top to myself. I sat by a cliff that plummeted straight down to the ocean, half a kilometre below. Ahead, beyond the shimmering blue water, the snow-capped mountains, hazy in the sunlight. To my right, there was a mountain that seemed like a stadium from another world where gods might fight to the death, and to my left was Segla, casting a long shadow over the town below, like the mother of all sundials. For the first time during the trip, I sat in one spot for an hour, feeling the sun and the wind on my skin, and absorbing what might be one of the most beautiful places on earth. I saw my first sign for Thrumsa the next day. By now, the country seemed like an old friend. In fact, we were new friends, of the type that had travelled together, that had seen each other at their best and at their worst. Fond memories floated through my mind. The astonished looks of Trolltonga hikers upon seeing a man with a loaded bike high up in the mountains. Moments on ferries when I was happy to be moving north from the comfort of a lounge. Pitching my tent in the wild and the accompanying sense of freedom the content expressions in the faces of other cyclists, and times when I basked in the idea that this was reality, not life at home, and that it was always there waiting for me. I thought about the hard times too, about the cold and rain, the damp clothes, the dank tent, the climbs and the insects, how big Norway had looked on the map. I thought back to my first night when, on a depressing track beside the road, I was swarmed by flies as I tried hopelessly to adjust my gears on my upside down bike. Of course, all these moments made the present that much sweeter. I thought about how the mountains would still be there long after I'd gone, after I'd gone home, and after I'd gone gone. A thousand cyclists had ridden this road before me, and a thousand more would after me, and still the mountains would be there, watching, their timelessness illuminating the brevity of our lives, and spurring us to see the world while we can. Then, pulling me from my musings, Trumser appeared across the water, sprawled beneath a panorama of shining white mountains. After four weeks and two and a half thousand kilometres, at last there it was, the caps of the Arctic, 
and the end of my ride. Hey, so I'm on a long bridge right now and on the other side of this long bridge, finally, 